The Unshackled Waves, episode 106. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. The Unshackled Waves has been broadcasting for over a year now. During that time we have discussed a wide variety of topics and had many policy experts on the show, but one area of public policy we haven't looked at, and it is fair to say hasn't been in the news that much this year, is health policy. The Australian health system has always faced significant budgetary and delivery challenges. I thought the best person to speak to on this issue is Terry Barnes. He's been a senior advisor to two federal health ministers, Michael Woodridge and Tony Abbott. He was the person who initially proposed the Abbott government's ill-fated $7 Medicare co-payment. He is currently a public policy consultant and is a regular contributor to The Spectator Australia. He has also appeared on Sky News and I've heard him speak over the years at many conservative and libertarian events. Terry, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Tim. Now, I thought I'd start off with an overview of the Australian health system. Now, uh, the opinion that I get from uh, a lot of people who aren't engaged in uh, politics or uh, public policy is that they like our health system as it is. They can go to a doctor any time and get it bulk billed if necessary, free of charge. They often look at, say, the American health system in horror and say, oh, look at all these people who don't have access to, to health care. And they say it's been working well for um, uh, 30 years. Uh, why do we need to uh, change it? Well, I think we always need to keep reforming, uh, whatever it happens to be, and uh, health and Medicare are no exception. Uh, the system on the whole has done reasonably well for 30 odd years, but when you think about the fact that we have a, a, an ageing population, that it, you know that uh, people over 65 are steadily getting older, then the baby boomers like myself are, are starting to knock on the door of um, uh, the high need end of our lives. Um, I've hoped to have a little way to go before that happens myself. Um, but also because of changes in our our, our, our habits as a, as a society, our lifestyle habits, particularly in the way that uh, um, yeah, younger kids, kids and younger people aren't as, you know, you can't assume them to be totally healthy all the time in the way perhaps uh, my generation were uh, in terms of uh, uh, the fact that, you know, do things like we're doing now, sitting down and talking, uh, be, playing with your computer, being sedentary, not being active as uh, some, some uh, certainly previous generations were. Uh, we're going to have a, a surge of demand in the middle of the 21st century, which uh, I think we have to plan for, we have to anticipate, and we have to make sure that we can cope with uh, uh, people knocking on the door of not just the uh, hospital system, but the health system as a whole. And... Medicare itself, because it's been geared to uh, a world that is now past, you know, the world of the 1950s and especially the 1960s and 70s, is not necessarily fit for purpose in the way that it was even 10 years ago. So that was one of the reasons that the GP co-payment was a big issue in the 2014 budget, for instance. And obviously the Australian federal debt is now approaching uh, $600 billion. Uh, How much... A of that is due to health expenditure or increases in health expenditure? Well, roughly the health budget's about $160 billion a year. I mean, that's in terms of total health spending, uh, federal and state. But then again, you've got to keep in mind that the federal government actually contributes a lot to state spending on health through public hospitals as well. And then there's private health and private health insurance. I mean, uh, out-of-pocket expenses as well as uh, your private health insurance premium. So. Uh, that's quite a lot of money. And of course, if uh, the, the federal government is, is forking out uh, a problem by far the major share of that $160 billion, uh, that's a big uh, big call on uh, the Treasury, on, on your, your and my tax resources. And that's a, that's a real problem. And that's, again, uh, we have to be able to afford uh, the system into the future. Not to, and actually, it's not just demand, as I was saying before, it's also the cost of of healthcare in terms of uh, the fact that we can do far much more, far, far more than we could ever do before, uh, particularly in terms of keeping people alive longer uh, with the benefits of medical technology, whether it's uh, new treatments, whether it's machines that go ping, whether it's uh, um, 
you know, you, the medicines you take, those high cost drugs that uh, uh, keep people going and the fact that we can do that, uh, but do it at a cost is something I don't think that we as a community and as a policy uh, issue have had a, a really a decent discussion about and frankly, because of the way that people don't like to talk about these things and sweep them under the carpet, uh, we probably won't have a conversation at all. Uh, one of the, the health issues that you've written about quite a bit is uh, preventative uh, health. Uh, obviously, if we prevent people uh, you know, getting ill, that saves us a lot of money in the, the longer term. But how is that achieved in uh, public policy? Well, I think, Tim, part of the problem is politics when it comes to prevention or primary care, uh, like going to the GP. Um, so that you head off more expensive treatments, whether it's specialists, whether it's hospitals, whatever. Um, uh, we don't, uh, uh, you know, politics comes down to things like public hospitals, public hospital waiting lists, waiting times, um, ambulances, you know, going on bypass, uh, bricks and mortar, you know, uh, uh, the hospital beds. Uh, the fact that Many things can be treated far better and smarter these days out of hospital rather than in hospital is something that gets lost in political debate because it's easy for the oppositions of the day, and that could be the coalition or it could be Labor, to actually score points at both the federal and state level by going to the pressure points that they know score uh, political points as well. And that usually comes down to, to public hospitals or what uh, one... Uh, uh, leading expert in the in the field, one of the architects of Medicare, actually, called um, cathedrals of care. I mean, uh, uh, it's good to go to a cathedral, but uh, you don't want to actually go there every week, do you? So, it's important, I think, to bring the public conversation along with the uh, advances in the way that we can treat people, so that people actually accept that things are going to be done better if they're done differently to what they're used to or what the politicians tell them is uh, is right and what's and tell them what's wrong in my initial question i, I talked about how uh, a lot of people are worried about uh, uh, us being without the uh, safety net, as you call it. As I mentioned, they, uh, even though it's a bit inaccurate the way they view the American health system, they, they, they worry about that there won't be health care for the most vulnerable. Do you accept that um, Australians do expect there to be a, a, sa a safety net for, for health for the most vulnerable? Uh, I think, uh, yes, for the most vulnerable, but I think the problem is, Tim, that uh, too many people, uh, particularly people who can afford to make a reasonable contribution to their health care, particularly if they don't uh, need to use the system very often, maybe if they go to the doctor a few times a year, for instance. Um, I, I still struggle to think and understand why they believe that bulk billing should be absolutely sacred. I mean, they, you know, the, le the left like to talk about the slippery slope if you uh, change the rules of bulk billing that uh, you're going to get rid of it ultimately altogether. But frankly, uh, I think people, people like like myself, you know, professional on a reasonable income, uh, should be able to sort of be charged or make a contribution to going to the doctor a few times a year or uh, or uh, making sure that I have private health insurance. I mean, the fact that less than half the population, including obviously far, even less, far less than half the affluent population don't uh, do have private health insurance as opposed to rely entirely on the public system, I frankly, I think is wrong. I think... Uh, it's not just a, 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 a policy disgrace. I think it's actually a, a breakdown in um, uh, personal values uh, that uh, if you really want to help uh, those who are less well off, you, uh, you do, you, you know, it's a bit like uh, uh, the safety drill in, a, in, a, you know, in an aeroplane when you're about to take off and the, they talk about the oxygen masks, you actually, uh, they, what do they say? Uh, that, uh, uh, put put your own mask on before you try and help others. And uh, when it comes to contributing to the cost of your own health care, I think that's exactly what that's all about. Now, you were the architect of the uh, $7 Medicare cone payment that was announced in the, the first hockey budget of 2014. And uh, I've heard you speak and you say yeah, that you're a uh, self-confessed uh, failure uh, on, on this issue. Um, why did it uh, fail? Uh, was it the, the politics of the day or the uh, sales pitch? Uh, uh, and what can we learn from uh, uh, this episode? Well, 
I don't like being described as the architect of the government's $7 GP co-payment, Tim, because I wasn't. Um, what I did was advocate in a policy paper uh, for a think tank uh, uh, that to, yeah, to, to simply look at whether the Hawke government's 1990s GP co-payment updated to 2013 at that stage, which uh, meant a $6 uh, per visit co-payment could actually work. And I, I suggested a framework in which it could work. Um, but uh, because of budget speculation in 2013, 14, it took on a life of its own. And it, as it turned out, the government itself was doing its own work behind the scenes and leaving uh, yours truly to go out there and advocate the the, the cause and be like the canary in the coal mine and see if I dropped off the perch and uh, uh, and you know I'd like to think I did okay and in, in the debate and uh, I didn't drop off the perch but the problem was that what the government introduced uh, was politically unrealistic in policy terms it didn't achieve what they wanted to achieve which was to send a price signal in re relation to going to the GP um, and the main reason for doing that uh, that I say that is that what they did was put it into this hypothecated medical research fund, and which was totally out of the blue. Uh, and nobody could actually sort of see what benefit for them of doing that was. So, and 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 as I said before, there was a there is a slippery slope uh, argument that's always put about when it comes to Medicare, full stop, and bulk billing in particular. You know that uh, if you start doing this, then you're just going to go all the way and get rid of Medicare altogether which is wrong, uh, but that's what uh, the opponents of change actually want you to believe, whether they're people in what I, I call the Medicare establishment, you know, the, the doctors, the AMA, um, uh, health policy experts or self-appointed health policy experts, um, and of course, uh, politicians who want to score populist points by opposing a, a change to what is seen as a popular system. I mean, in, a sec in effect, what the government what Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey particularly, and also Peter Dutton didn't realise was that um, any changes to Medicare were like killing Bambi and uh, you just don't announce them. You actually, you need to actually bring people along with you. You need to be able to explain the benefits of change and you don't do that after it's actually brought down in as a centrepiece of a big saving budget as they did in 2014. You actually, um, you actually gradually make the case um, inform people about why some change is necessary, uh, what benefits the change will bring, and, and, and make people realise that the world was not going to end. And one of the interesting things, Tim, is that when this debate was really going, uh, people came up to me who are frequent flyers in the system, you know, the elderly, pensioners, uh, uh, people with young children, um, and, and said, um, yeah, good on you. I mean, that uh, this is actually something that we don't mind paying, say, $6 a visit for because uh, we get such good care from our GPs that we want to actually contribute to that and make sure that they continue to provide a quality service. So, in effect, they understood what the price signal was all about. It was the vested interests and the, and the, the political opponents who actually tried to and successfully take it, it did take it apart. And it was also um, the, the fact of the, the politics of the issue, the fact that it was viewed as a, uh, a broken promise. And also they, they just announced it on a budget night. There, was, there wasn't any sort of soft, uh, uh, soft diplomacy in the months leading up to the budget where this is uh, what, what we might do. So it wasn't that I felt that the co-payment itself was rejected, but as always, it's the ability to sell it and politi politically manage it. Well, that's right. I mean, as I said before, I was the canary in the coal mine in the run up to the 2014 budget because uh, I was the one that ended up carrying the debate because the government did not put their toe in the water, really. Um, I guess they wanted to keep their own uh, position under wraps. But as I said before, I mean, the fact that I survived in that debate probably emboldened them politically to say, oh, well, look, I think we can do this. But uh, it's a bit of a difference when uh, a former uh, Howard government advisor writing a paper for a think tank says something as to when the Treasurer of the Commonwealth of Australia in the, the first budget after an election says it. And, and as you say, rightly point out, it wasn't, actually it wasn't a broken promise at all uh, because it wasn't cutting Medicare, um, but it was certainly out of the blue. Uh, people weren't expecting it. They certainly weren't expecting it on the scale that they were doing and they did not expect 
it would be linked to a never never medical research fund that had no real practical tangible here and now benefit to the consumers you know the, the punters who are being expected to pay the co-payment if they knew that it was going say into um, hospital infrastructure or uh, equipment infrastructure or doctors and nurses even uh, uh, particularly you know if you look at it in terms of what uh, uh, Medicare rebates are paid if it was actually being reinvested in higher rebates uh, that could have been sold and could have been sold really well. But the bottom line is that before the budget, the government did not sell at all. And after the budget, it did not sell well. And when things got tough for it pretty well straight away, they got they dug their heels in. They didn't actually ask them the question, sells the question, can we actually improve this proposal and make it work? And there were ways and means of doing that. Um, but uh, effectively what happened was that the government, you know, the coalition government allowed its opponents to call the shots. And I'm not meaning the Labor Party as much as the Australian Medical Association and its allies. I mean, uh, I said when the co-payment went down in 2015 and both Tony Abbott as Prime Minister and Bill Shorten as opposition leader said, in, in future we will not make uh, significant changes to Medicare without ensuring the doctors and the Australian Medical Association are on board. I, I said that effectively that makes the national president of the AMA the de facto health minister of Australia. And uh, in many ways, I, look, I don't think that's changed. If anything, uh, I think uh, the current government has got to uh, reform shy when it comes to, to, to um, the health system as a whole, though it is doing some reasonable things in terms of reviewing the Medicare schedule and private health insurance. But the Labor Party has basically gone totally populist. So pop so populist in the 2016 campaign, of course, we had the Medi scare about the alleged privatisation of Medicare. But they they you know, talked about you talk about broken promises in 2013. I mean, effectively, Bill Shorten promised that if we or phrased his promise in such a way that if Labor comes in and cuts just one dollar out of Medicare, he's broken that promise. That's how ironclad it was, and how therefore practically stupid it was. And of course, uh, uh, eventually Tony Abbott declared that the Medicare co-payment was dead buried and uh, cremated, which is also what he said about uh, uh, work choices. So it does, as with uh, workplace laws, does this make future uh, health reform, free market reform more difficult to achieve because the, the coalition has now had this bad experience with the Medicare uh, co-payment and you know, incurring the wrath of, you know, as you mentioned, not just Labor, but the um, Medical Association makes them more timid to tackle this issue in the future? Yes, I think that's right. Uh, from the government sort of the coalition side, they are now reform averse or reform shy in healthcare. But I think Greg Hunt, the current health minister, is doing a reasonable job doing pushing through what he thinks he can get through. Uh, and that's really, I suppose, politics, they say, is the art of the possible. But from the from the left side, uh, they're so they were so absolute in their opposition and they've, as I, as I was saying before, effectively have painted themselves into a corner with their rhetoric so that um, they're not uh, going to uh, do anything bold in terms of uh, structural reform of Medicare uh, without losing a lot of political capital if they manage to uh, win the next election because they promised people so absolutely that uh, not a hair on the Medicare head will be touched that there's really given themselves no room to move. And and frankly, I, I think the, the, the result of this as far as health policy goes is that uh, policy is not dictating the terms of engagement, populism is, and that's what Bill Shorten has, has, has cottoned on to, and I suspect that's where the coalition will go in terms of uh, minimising any change. Now, I'd like to talk about some uh, free market healthcare solutions. Uh, so, uh, often I hear from the left and uh, socialists that, you know, nobody should be able to, you know, profit from, uh, you know, sickness or essential service of uh, others. But uh, you and I know that, you know, the free market, it can deliver, uh, you know, higher quality and often more cost effective uh, outcomes. Uh, now, um, could you provide some examples of or cases in other jurisdictions where that's worked? Well, to be honest, I think uh, there are very few in the Western world, I think, that actually qualify as free market, including the United States. So, uh, 
Um, I think what you really should be saying is that the private sector has a role in, in the provision of health care, and that is something that uh, uh, certainly the, um, uh, the centre-right in Australian politics believes. And I think uh, uh, it, even in most uh, Western jurisdictions in one form or another, the private sector is involved. It's not, uh, uh, it's not a free market in terms of uh, uh, ultimately because uh, um, except with, with the notable exception of the United States where private payers and private insurers dominate, uh, effectively um, government subsidies in one form or another do, whether it's uh, Australian style Medicare or the UK style NHS. So, um, but uh, I think it's absolutely essential that the private sector is involved. There is no shame, uh, contrary to what the left says, uh, in uh, making a reasonable return on your investment if you're a private uh, operator in the healthcare space. Uh, um, effectively, if there is an incentive to uh, uh, to get a return by contributing uh, your your capital, your expertise, your technical. Uh, um, yeah, your technical products as well as your uh, your private services if you say a medical practitioner um, and 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 I, I've got to say in Australia too Tim and when um, doctors and the AMA claim that uh, uh, medical practitioners are free and independent they're not uh, they're absolutely dependent on um, the, the teeth of Medicare and uh, particularly in the case of medical specialists on, on private health insurance so they uh, they take what they can get and uh, um, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, many do doctors as a, as a profession are probably the greatest socialists uh, that we have. And now one of the uh, policy proposals that's put out by uh, free market think tanks, including uh, some in Australia, is the idea of a health savings account where you put uh, money from uh, your income into a dedicated uh, health account to pay for your health care. How is this uh, more efficient than the, the current system that we have? Look, I think health savings accounts is an idea that's been around for a long time and it works quite successfully in a small country like Singapore. Uh, and I personally don't have a problem with the health savings accounts or people self-insuring. I don't think people should be forced to take out private health insurance. I mean, they should be encouraged to provide for themselves. Uh, and, uh, and and certainly uh, if there are appropriate incentives, not just private health insurance rebates to help them to do that, then, then that's appropriate. Um, I think the problem with health savings accounts is the risk that um, you uh, don't have enough in the account if you really have a uh, a major need, say so you've uh, you know, got a experience with life-threatening cancer and uh, you know a series of surgeries, uh, lots of um, chemo and radiotherapy, uh, lots of time in hospital. Um, that could cost tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And of course, some some surgical pr procedures actually can do that in one hit. So you need to be able to to provide for that. And uh, and more to the point, I suppose, if you're talking about policy, you need to be able to know how somehow though the gap is going to be filled when the money runs out of the account. So, uh, but look, look, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem in principle with the appropriate drawdown on superannuation uh, to, to fund or, or to, to provide for uh, dealing with uh, unexpected episodes of care. But one way or another, I think we do need to get encouraged people, particularly people on reasonable incomes to provide more for themselves uh, and not just rely on the taxpayer or fellow taxpayers and the public system to do it all for them. And uh, there's also a lot of um, uh, free market health experts who say that the way that private health insurance is set up at the moment needs to be reformed. Uh, you mentioned there that some medical expenses can, can be quite large and so they also advocate that private health insurance should be only catastrophic health insurance uh, for, for those, you know, when you have you know, cancer or something like that, which incurs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is, is, th is that something you agree with as well? No, I, I don't actually. I think that private health insurance needs to be uh, um, as uh, relevant to the needs of people as possible. And if uh, uh, younger and healthier people, for instance, uh, um, keep their private health insurance for um, hospital cover just in case, but uh, want to have um, um, extras cover so they can have their massages and they can have their physio and they can have their um, you know, optical and so on. I don't have a problem with that. 
Um, I don't have a problem with the taxpayer giving a, a private health insurance rebate because, uh, um, you know, some time ago uh, some work was done that uh, by by Professor Ian Harper, who's now a governor of the Reserve Bank, or sorry, you know, Reserve Bank governor, um, who he actually was able to show that for each dollar of um, private health insurance rebate that the um, federal government kicks in, that actually saved two dollars in federal and state health spending. So it was, uh, you know, spend one, save two. Uh, so there was a, a public benefit in doing that. Uh, I think the, the issue with uh, using the rebate at the moment, though, is that uh, some private health insurers have got a bit complacent, a bit lazy when it comes to um, making sure that they are running uh, as um, efficiently as possible and, and covering as much as possible. Um, and that's, you know, and that's a question that uh, has to be asked, but I suppose it goes back to the question, the other question of politics, uh, is removing the private health insurance or modifying it severely too hard a political ask. But the other side of it, which no government, Labor or Coalition, seems to want to, to actually grasp, is uh, um, the fact that premiums for private health insurance go up, and therefore the cost of the private health insurance rebate, because of the cost of providing care. You know, it's it's the, uh, the cost of the doctors, the cost of the hospital, the cost of the optical and dental and so on and so forth, the cost of the uh, the, the prostheses, the medical devices and other things that uh, get stuck into you, like your artificial hips. Um, it's uh, yeah, effectively taking on those vested interests. Prostheses, because they're, they're done, you know, basically manufactured and supplied by big multinational companies, politically they're much easier to manage, but taking on taking on the medical lobby and particularly taking on the AMA about uh, um, payments to doctors and therefore doctors' income is uh, a very difficult political ask and I don't think either side of politics dares to go there and I'm very disappointed with that. Uh from our discussion, it, it seems to be that both in the, the public sector and private sector that the cost of uh, health care is increasing. How, how, do, how do we get it? Because obviously in other industries we've, or, uh, that are governed by the free market, we've seen you know, prices reduced. I mean, just look at technology, for example. Um, how, how can that be achieved in, in the health sector? Well, I think... Uh you need to ensure that uh, public regulation, government regulation, uh, allows for a level playing field in um, price negotiations between payers and providers, so insurers or governments and uh, hospitals, doctors and so on. Uh, at the moment, the, the playing field is tilted very much in favour of the provider um, and regulations effectively tie particularly private insurers' hands behind their back. So um, the bottom line is that uh, health cost inflation is running at uh, five to six percent a year, um, which is roughly you know, more than double uh, CPI. So, um, and it just keeps going up and enough and up. Uh, and as I said at the start of this conversation, uh, the demand pressures that we're going to have uh, in 10, 20 years time are just not going to be able to cope with that. And certainly, I think uh, the national budget and I think the economy as a whole are not going to cope with that. So. Some really hard questions need to be asked now before it's too late, but because of the political climate, and I think this is one of the great regrets of the 2014 budget and the co-payment, is that those questions are not going to be asked and neither side of politics is going to have the uh, political courage to deal with them. Now, you worked with uh, Tony Abbott when he was health minister, so I can't have you That's on right. the show with, with without asking you uh, about his future. Now, after he was deposed as prime minister, he made the decision to stay in parliament. He claimed there would be no undermining, no leaking or no sniping. A lot of people have said that he's uh, broken that vow, and a lot of people have said that his commentary on uh, the Liberal Party this year has been unhelpful, though I have to say that that he's probably behaved better during the uh, postal survey because I think that gave him, you know, something uh, to, to campaign on, which is what he's good at. Now, there's still yeah. speculation that he could uh, return to the leadership amongst the uh, conservative uh, commentariat. Is that a view that you share? And if he, you know, can't return to leadership, what uh, what does his future hold? Well, I think. Um whether he should return to the leadership uh, 
in terms of his own career is something that uh, uh, if I were him, I would not be you know, taking the poison chalice that Malcolm Turnbull is basically going to hand on to whoever succeeds him. Um, effectively, I think what the Liberal Party learned after September 2015 is that uh, these types of leadership changes have major transactional costs, not just internally, but externally in terms of, of how you're perceived by the voting public. As far as Tony Abbott goes, look, I, I think uh, one of the coalition's best uh, best performers, particularly political and campaign performers, is actually la languishing on the backbench. And it was disappointing uh, that uh, Malcolm Turnbull didn't take the opportunity after the, the 2016 election was finalised to bring him back into the ministry. I think uh, Tony Abbott in Cabinet, uh, with his experience, with his political nous, and the fact uh, Yes, he is the best opposition leader we ever had, uh, which means that he knows how to campaign, he knows how to write, do politics. That's one thing that's been missing from the government, I think, uh, under Malcolm Turnbull, that uh, uh, he could have uh, brought back into the mix. Now, there is a, uh, a reshuffle that's pending. Uh, that's uh, you know, not least to make Peter Dutton this homeland security uh, um, super czar. Um, but other changes, I hope, will be made. And uh, it's still not too late, I think, to bring Tony Abbott in. And then if you talk about uh, um, Tony's um, eruptions from the back bench over the last 12 months or so, the one thing about Tony Abbott, in my view, is that uh, he actually respects the um, traditions of parliament and, and cabinet government, and particularly cabinet solidarity. So um, if he were in cabinet, he wouldn't be speaking out. He wouldn't have the freedom to speak that he has as a backbencher and he would consider himself bound by cabinet solidarity here the one thing about tony is that he is loyal he's straight and he's not a leaker so um you know, it may well be that the relations between the current prime minister and the former prime minister are not personally not brilliant um but if uh, both of them are prepared to put their differences aside for the benefit of, of the good of the party and for the good of the country uh, then I think that that show of unity might be a big step forward in uh, keeping the Liberal Party and the coalition as a whole in the political game against Labor. The reason why I mentioned his uh, campaigning during the marriage uh, postal survey, because that is when we saw the, the old Tony Abbott emerge. Now, even though he uh, his side lost the, the, the postal survey, there is still the, the other issue of energy affordability, which does resonate uh, with the electorate. So he, he still does have you know, his, his finger on the, the hot button issue uh, there. Uh, and there's certainly a role for him to, uh, if he was given that opportunity that uh, you, talk, you talk about, uh, for him to uh, make a contribution. But, but it seems to me that the reason Malcolm Turnbull is prepared to keep him on the back bench is because Turnbull, I think, feels dudded himself that he wasn't made treasurer in Abbott's government and so wants to punish Abbott by keeping him on the back bench while he's Prime Minister. Oh, I disagree with that. I, I think uh, if I was reading anything into it, uh, I, I would think that perhaps the Prime Minister... Um, uh, knows about former leaders in cabinet uh, from his own behaviour and, and possibly uh, thinks that uh, where I went, Tony could go too. Uh, but as I said, I don't think Tony is that type of operator. I think he is uh, somebody who takes uh, his role as a cabinet minister, let alone as a prime minister, seriously um, and uh, respects the conventions of uh, cabinet government, especially cabinet solidarity. But uh, so the point I think that you made about his campaigning skills is right. I mean, uh, he can put his finger on hot button issues that concern the electorate, not what concerns the, the you know, the parliamentary bubble and, and energy affordability is a good case in point. But he's also good with coming up with simple killer lines that uh, cut through, whereas um, the Prime Minister you know, still talks like a barrister sometimes. He argues a brief rather than uh, um, plays, plays the politician. and. Uh, uh, really, I think where the coalition is at the moment, they need to get their politics right as well as their policy. And uh, and with a little look, it's not too late. Uh, whether the citizenship issue means that more MPs fall by the wayside and it means an election is sooner rather than later, or not, um, you know, I'd like to see Parliament run to its full term. If it does, I still think there's a reasonable chance that the coalition can recover from where they are. But uh, it's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to be putting the A-team on the paddock. And if you want the A-team on the paddock, you have to have Tony Abbott in it. 
Now, a lot of the media commentary has said, you know, he's being a wrecker, he's uh, trashing the Liberal Party. Do you think that's the media, you know, because they've obviously never liked Tony Abbott, that's uh, a media beat-up? Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, as you say, the media as a whole has never liked Tony Abbott, particularly never liked his brand of conservatism. Uh, and... Uh, Really, uh, uh, they they are piling it on him and have been piling it on for some years. Uh, and and some of that, yeah, you have to say that Tony Abbott himself allowed to happen. I mean, uh, he made mistakes in his prime ministership that uh, I sense some. I do sense that he has realised now were mistakes. And self awareness is the the first big step to rehabilitation and recovery. So. Uh, if he has understood that, I mean, uh, I've you know, been criticism. Of, I know that he has, uh, in terms of the policy manifestos that he's been running through the year, um, that he didn't like uh, his uh, position on Section 18C, for instance, that he didn't follow through when he was prime minister and had the opportunity. If he now realises that he should have, and he could have, and he, and if he is, you know, in a position again, he would, he would then that's actually a positive thing. But uh, um, my sense at the moment is that uh, it would be unlikely he would become Prime Minister again or leader of the Liberal Party, but I think he can become a Cabinet Minister again and be a very effective uh, contributor to the team at a time where the team is uh, a bit lost and divided. Uh, going back to what you said previously about uh, Turnbull, he, he definitely lacks that campaigning uh, skill and really, you know, smashing the the opposition. Like going back to the twenty sixteen election, like I don't, I, I think if you know Tony Abbott was still prime minister, that allowing you know Mediscare to fester, that would have never have happened under uh, Tony Abbott's leadership. And I was surprised right. that the I, I, have, I have no doubt that's right. And the coalition, they didn't the really problem... hammer uh, Labor on like the issues on the the boats and or, or, and you know they were going to bring back a, a form of carbon tax. They they really let Labor you know off scot free in that regard. Well, they did, uh, and I think that's uh, but it's water under the bridge. Uh, you can't uh, fight the last campaign. You have to look forward to the next one, and you actually have to come up with uh, a policy program that is actually looking forward as well. Um, there's no point in crying over spilt milk. It's done. It's dusted. Um, you know, Malcolm Turnbull, as leader, paid the price for that in terms of the election result. Um, the thing that the coalition has to do now is survive. Uh, it has to regroup and survive. And uh, it's in the. It's not just in their interest. It's in the interest of all those who know that uh, we need a competent, stable centre-right government to to lead this country forward. And uh, but I think opinion polls are making it also very clear that uh, changing prime ministers again, uh, you know, another round of that revolving door is not what voters want either. They want some stability in the terms of leadership. And frankly, uh, if the Liberal Party has learnt one lesson from 2015 is that uh, the costs of tossing a, a leader after a couple of years are just not worth it. And so you're definitely a um, bit more optimistic than, than, than some are at the moment. You do think that there is a, a way out of this current hole the coalition find itself in? There's a glimmer. There's a glimmer. I mean, if, if uh, basically uh, the English cricket team can bowl Australia out for 130-odd uh, when it all look black, anything can happen. Uh, you know, it's, but they, they need to get themselves back in the game like the English team did in the Test match in Adelaide. Uh, if they can do that by showing a bit of discipline, having a bit of a political nous and uh, having a bit of policy purpose, they've got a shot. But uh, it's going to be difficult. There's no question that they are definitely behind the eight ball. But if I can put it this way, 53-47, two party preferred in the polls looks bad. But 52-48 and going into an election campaign is winnable. Uh, they have to get themselves in a position where it's 51-49 or 52-48 and they, they can go from there with a the good campaign because in, whatever you say about Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott, I don't think the public has warmed to Bill Shorten and Labor. And, uh, and with the right campaign, the coalition can actually cut through uh, Labor's populist promises and their, their, their glib rhetoric about, uh, you know, effectively... You know, we'll throw billions at every problem that uh, we can find uh, to kiss it, kiss it better for you. 
Um, they can do that, but uh, they really need to unite themselves first, and that's what's missing at the moment. Well, I've certainly appreciated your insights to today, Terry, and thank you for taking the time out to talk with us. Great pleasure, Tim. Thanks for asking. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As I've mentioned previously, we are aiming to continue the Unshackled Waves right up until the end of the year. We still have some major guests lined up, so make sure you keep tuning in. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.